Good morning and welcome to The Day at First Presbyterian Church. My name is Pastor Danny Deeth, and I want to welcome you to this Easter celebration. Last week, we walked with Jesus on the back of the donkey as he went into Jerusalem for the last time. In the past week, he has taught. He has joined with the disciples on Monday, Thursday for the Last Supper. He washed feet. He was betrayed and arrested. Then we were with him on Good Friday as he was crucified, dead, and buried. But today, friends, everything changes. Today is Easter. Today is resurrection. So let us celebrate together. Come on in. First reading today comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 25, verses 6 through 9. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well aged wine, of rich food filled with marrow, of well aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our scripture passage is from the end of Mark. We have already spoiled this story for you in saying that Christ has been raised, but I want you to hear it anyway. From Mark's account, we are in the last chapter of Mark, Mark 16. Listen with fresh ears to the word of the Lord. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He's not here. Look, there is the place they laid him, but go and tell his disciples in Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he has told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. Dun, dun, dun. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Just as he told you and us. A lot of people tell us stuff in our life. A lot of people are telling us and giving us information. It's so hard, isn't it? We live this on a daily basis. Who do we trust who tells us truth? Now, parents, we have special license at times to help guide our children. I'm going to share to you a few things that either current parents have told their children or adult children who are still trying to get over what their parents told them when they were children. 
and I'm not gonna blow anyone's cover. I will neither confirm nor deny any of these statements, but that they were written by those who remember. When I was about five years old, my father told me that chicken nuggets at McDonald's were made of cat paws. <laughs> my naive mind believed it without questioning, and for most of my childhood, I did not eat chicken nuggets. My parents used to tell me and my only brother that we had a third brother who was turned into a mushroom because he would not take a bath. <laughs> and they would put pictures of mushrooms in the family albums <laughs> and say, oh, it's so sad, here's your brother who never took a bath. My mother told me that spinach would make me strong like Popeye. How many? Yes, yes, okay. And if I ate it, I could lift the house. I would have a few spoonfuls and then she'd rush us outside so that I could try to lift the house. And she'd say, it moved, it moved, quick, eat some more. And I'd run back in and finish my spinach. When I was little, my dad told me that toys grew under the weeds in the yard. If I pulled enough, eventually a toy would pop out. <laughs> my mother was a genius. She told us that brown M&Ms were only, uh, only for adults. So whenever we encountered a brown M&M, we would give it to her. <laughs> Good thinking. We have to leave the zoo now, a mother said to her child. The zookeeper called my cell phone and said, your crying is upsetting the animals. We can't eat french fries because we aren't from France. <laughs> if I eat my green beans, then I will turn into the green power ranger when I am older. That never happened, mom, this particular one said. When she was small, I told my daughter that when she lied, a red spot would appear on the middle of her forehead. I knew for sure it worked when she did indeed tell a lie and her hand went up to cover her forehead. <laughs> I want to carry you, child, but the doctor said your legs would stop growing if you don't walk. I told my kids if they didn't behave while waiting in the drive through line, they'd get a sad meal. <laughs> this one is sweet. I've always been fascinated with space. When I was a little girl, my dad would take his ladder and put it on our lawn when the moon was full. He would then bring me outside and told me he put the moon up for me. And now he has passed away and every night when I see the moon, I think of him. That's so sweet. And finally, my mom told my sister that they only name hurricanes after girls, otherwise they would be hemicanes. <laughs> Parents. We don't know always what the truth is. We can't always trust those who are telling us things. So how do we know that Jesus is trustworthy with the words that he told us? Let's backtrack a little bit before we get to the scripture from today. When we were here last, it was Palm Sunday. We were celebrating Jesus coming into Jerusalem on the donkey. The palm fronds were there, their cloaks and the palms, Hosanna in the highest blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. It was generally seen as a positive triumphal day. Once Jesus gets to Jerusalem throughout the week, in three of the gospels on Monday, he overturns the tables. Tuesday, he teaches in parables, condemns the Pharisees again for the last time. Wednesday was relatively silent, although some say that's the day Judas betrayed Jesus and went and collected his 30 pieces of silver. And then Thursday that we call Mondi Thursday, M-A-U-N-D-Y, Mondi, which means command or mandate. And it was that night that they were gathered in the upper room where Jesus commanded us to break the bread. And every time we break it, do so in remembrance of him. The cup the same way, every time you drink this, do so in remembrance of me. And in John's gospel, Love one another as I have loved you. That, those are the commands, the mandates of the Last Supper. Then we know Jesus leaves, goes to Gethsemane. They fall asleep. He's alone. He's praying. 
God, not my will, but yours be done. He knows what's coming. So they come, Judas betrays him. They arrest him and begins this cycle of Jesus going to the chief priests, going to Pilate and back. Each step he is beaten. Each step it is difficult for him until finally Pilate, who will do anything to keep from a riot, a riot from happening in Jerusalem, that is his job to maintain the order at Passover when Jerusalem swells in its attendance because it's one of the travel festivals that they have to come to Jerusalem for. So there's people everywhere. We can't have a riot and uprising. So Pilate finally gives in to the demands and Christ is executed, crucified on the cross. He dies. There are supernatural earthquakes and darkness. There are other things that happen. He is taken down and he is buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And that's before today where everything and everybody was. On Friday, all of the disciples, everyone who knew and followed Jesus thought it was a sham. They thought that all of the things that he told them, just as he told them was wrong. Why? Because he was dead. The Messiah cannot be dead or he wouldn't be the Messiah. Messiah comes with military strength to liberate Israel from the occupiers in Rome. He died shamefully on a cross. How, how is that the Messiah? So they were all reeling in guilt, in shame, in loss, confused, Saturday into Sunday. And that's where we come in. Still grief stricken, still trying to figure out what all this means, still trying to process it. The women come to dress his body as there was not time on Friday when they had to bury him. They've come to properly anoint and dress his body. How are we going to open the tomb, they say? Well, they didn't have to worry. It was open already. And in all of the gospel accounts, there are these angel figures, sometimes two, sometimes one, as in here. And essentially, they say, why do you look for the living among the dead? What are you doing here? He rose just as he told you. Just as he told you, he rose he did what he said he was going to do. Believe him, because it happened. These angels are the ones who just almost matter-of-factly say, oh no, he's, he's been raised. He, he told you he was going to be raised. Why don't you believe he's going to be raised? And in Mark's account, they say he's going back to Galilee. Go meet him there. And in this part of the account, that's, where it ends, they go away terrified and excited. Those two back to back. So, what does it mean for us? We get it. Was raised from the dead? Yay. Not my job, I don't believe to prove to you that this happened. I wasn't there. My job, I believe, is to encourage you to open yourself to the reality of Christ in our life and what this powerful resurrection means to us. Erasmus, a, a priest in the, around the 1500s, said, how much more marvelous is the resurrection even than creation? How much more amazing is it that God became man than even God making the angels? And said the act of creation was an act of power. The act of redemption was an act of mercy. What God did through Christ 
was to give us a way home from that time forward forevermore. For who? Presbyterians? Woo! For those who look like us, who think like us, who act like us, who work like us, who see like us, those who vote like us. Oh, look out, preacher. For all, for all humankind, Christ made every one of us, no matter what we believe, we are all children of God's creation. Therefore, we are brothers and sisters with humanity. Christ came for all, not to condemn the world, but to save it. Our job is to take this message of resurrection, joy, and grace, and hope, and peace, and light to the world. Not to sit on it, not to point our finger and say, oh, you better or else. Hot, hot in hell, that's where you're going to be if you don't believe what I believe. Our job is to share what we know about the goodness of Jesus Christ and his love and his life and his resurrection, but in the way that you've experienced it. There's no way we can prove this resurrection even by the accounts. How can we prove it? By our experience with God, with our experiences with Christ, with our experiences with the Holy Spirit. Now, you may never have looked at your life and thought that you had one of those moments, but have you stopped to think through? Often, conversion doesn't come in just one quick moment, although sometimes it does. Sometimes it entails us looking back and seeing where God has led us through our life to the places where we have been, the people we are with, to know that God is with us. The smoking gun of the existence of Jesus Christ is you. It is your faith. And that doesn't mean you are faithful every second of every day. You can recite the Bible from beginning to end. That's not what it's about. It means that you've had some moments with God. You know and believe that this is real from your study, your prayer, your service, your worship, your fellowship. All of it together for you and for us is the reality of Christ. And those are the things we share. You don't have to do it in fancy theological terms. You can say one time I was in the hospital and fill that out. One time I was in a Bible study class and kaboom, something new. The spirit moved me. Some, one time I was serving others and instead of that person being served by me, they served me by their witness and something happened. Smoking gun of Christ is each one of you as we seek to become closer to Christ. So open yourself, even if you have been a lifelong Christian, we are being called to renew ourselves and not to forget the resurrection power and love and glory. All of that is mercy, all of that is God's love. If God did not love us in the world, Christ would never have come. God would have said, let them deal with what they have done to themselves. But no, God says, I love them. They are created in my image. They are created good. I want to be in an intimate relationship with them and they with each other through me. So God sent Christ. And that's what we are called to do and to be. I love the very last part of this, which says, when the angel says, he's not here, he went on to Galilee. You are to go after him. He is going on ahead of you to Galilee. Christ was not raised and then went to the Sea of Galilee to sit on the beach and have some mimosas. Jesus was not on holiday for all he had been through. 
Jesus had work to do and he went right away. He did not tarry, he did not wait. He was resurrected, he was at the door and the angel said, he's already at work in Galilee. Go meet him there, he's got work for you. So as we contemplate what this resurrection means for us, we are to realize that Christ is already out. He's not here, he has been raised. And it is our job to go catch up with him. Where did he go? He went to Russia and to Ukraine. He went to Israel and he went to Palestine. And he went to the home of violence, and sadness. He went to the hospital where people are sick. He went into the homes of those who are studying and praying and celebrating. He went to be on the bench with the homeless person. He came to fill our souls as those who may have become complacent and are Jesus-y enough our call is not to follow Christ enough that maybe we can get in at the end time. Roll that dice. Pew. Our job is to go and catch him and follow him because he is working. And our work is marvelous. It is overwhelming. It is difficult. But we are Christ's hands and feet in this world and we are being beckoned by him. He has gone ahead of us to be present and to change the world. And in doing so, we are transformed and we start to build the kingdom that he died and rose for. So celebrate this resurrection, the glory, the joy. Be open to the experience for which you will know that Christ is real, alive in this world and let us go after him to follow the call that's been placed. He's waiting for us. Together, let's go. Hallelujah. Amen.